So good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so as usually, I try to focus a little bit on the ecosystem because <clears throat> the ecosystem at the end decides whether we have the right time to start investing or whether we also have the right time to, to keep on to our stocks. Uh, so once it has grown and you have the confidence to, to stay in it, it grows another 30% cash-wise, that makes a big difference. So ecosystem drives a lot. So in order to get some data on this ecosystem, I tried to do a worldwide survey on the ecosystem and I asked some protagonists only one question. Would you please give me your honest opinion about solutions to the finding situation of startups in the rest of the world? And <clears throat> they were all participants asked and the question was a total uh, disaster because the bankers didn't know what honest meant. Uh, the Chinese didn't mean know what opinion meant. The Middle East didn't know what solution meant. And the Greek didn't know what financing meant. So, and the USA didn't know what rest of the world meant. So um, after this disappointment on my survey, I said, okay, I have to do it the old fashioned way, um, trying to collect own data and see um, what does it mean, the subjective news that we get that so much money gets inv invested and do we have the fear of a bubble? So <clears throat> on a very high uh, top level, there have been only two, they are called the UBS Wells report, we call it entrepreneurial ages, when new industries get created. And this chart depicts the, uh, the percentage of the very high income people, so meaning the entrepreneurs, on the total wealth created. And we see when the industries, as uh, Jens did already allude to, the, the Siemens in the early 1900s started to create something. These were entrepreneurial age. And then between 40 and like 80 and a little bit later, these, these companies and industries were rolled out. And now new industries are created again. So I think on that macro perspective, we are pretty uh, good in shape. So do we have a bubble or not? <clears throat> so in order to, to analyze these questions, I would like to look at the public market, and then I would like to look, and, and, and there the normal equities and tech, and then afterwards within tech, a distinction between the public and the non-public tech. So here we see that all equities are at historic high levels, meaning the NASDAQ, but also DAX, Standard Poor's and Dow, and I would like to distinguish, make the distinction here between the new and the old economy. So what is striking <coughs> is when you compare on the left-hand side the price-earning multiples of the, the, the big tech ones, and on the right-hand side the old economy, you see that the price earnings aren't actually so much different. So you could say they are, within a variance of like 20%, pretty much similar valued. If you then overlay this data with revenue growth rates from the tech world and the old economy world, then you see that the multiples are pretty much the same, but the underlying growth rates in tech are something like 20, 15 to 25 percent, and old economy, the indices, the revenue growth, is, is a, it's a very disappointing 0.1 to 0.3 percent. Um, here you see it again in a chart. Um, so why is that? and everybody of you know, big correlation to the rise in public markets and especially old economy is the quantitative easing in, in, in terms of um, interest rates going down, assets are, are inflated. Um, <clears throat> for the tech world, so how is public tech? So everybody says, okay, still the remembrance of the 2000s, how there the IPO market destroyed basically the new ecosystem here. And so I tried to come up with some comparables um, depicting the old times versus the new times. And the sales of an average IPO in 2000 was 17 million. Now it is 92. Um, so 5.4 times more business is done at the same time of an IPO. We have enterprise values, the, the relative value of the IPOs when they get floated is, is, um, has increased or diminished uh, seven times. Um, and the maturity of the companies that get floated is, is nearly double the time that they had to, to time to, to scale and to become mature. Um, <clears throat> this is an overview of 
the exuberances in terms of relative valuation at the time when in 2000 companies were um, IPO'd, you still see that we had the, the, the our price earning ratios up to 400, but at least like 50, 50, 50, 120, and now we have four, the biggest ones in the, in the NASDAQ, we have pretty decent um, price earning ratios. So this is the one, this is the uh, view of how are they relatively valued. But what has also been achieved is that these kind of companies have emerged like monster superpower. So it means that these four companies have a market cap, a combined market cap of 1.5 trillion, uh, and the GDP of Australia is 1.4. So there's really, really um, monoliths have been built, and each of those represents basically a monopolist situation in a certain segment. And I think that is what we are seeing when we see high valuations, because the internet basically built monopolies either on a horizontal level or on vertical levels. And if you have that, scale will come and the valuation will be justified. So bubble or not, I'm not saying we have bubble or not. I'm just trying to understand the underlying things. For non-tech, we clearly have slow growth and quantitative easing, and disruption is rather a risk than a chance. And in the tech world, yeah, the disruption is a chance. We have pretty strong fundamentals and, um, and substantial growth. So now let's look at the private tech sector. So the private tech sector, yes, a lot of money has gone into that sector. That's undoubtable, but also we have to see that unlike three or four years ago, Everybody now is convinced that the internet is a very structural thing where everything accelerates pretty, pretty strongly, whereas like five years before it has, hasn't, hadn't had that penetration on big industry levels. Um, here is a very important chart. I did already show that at the last NOAA, but it's still an explanation for a lot what is happening. So when in the last cycles, and Cisco on Amazon or Microsoft IPO'd. And Cisco IPO'd with 200 million, and Amazon with 400 million market cap, and Microsoft with 700 million market cap. Whereas today, the Twitter, Facebook, Alibaba's, they IPO at humongous levels. What does that mean? That means that in the old times, the uh, fidelities, the T-Row prices of the world, which were basically public investors, could participate from public equity in the Cisco, Amazons, and Microsoft and made a decent return. If you are restricted with these very large sums or pools of capital to public equity, then for the tech, where the, the value increase happens very quickly, then you are excluded from that performance. So they have to, because the companies IPO at such a high stake that uh, valuation that most of the performance has already been uh, given to the private sector. And here, this is also very important. If you look at the different stages, the seed, angel, series, B, series, C is, has increased, but not to a very high degree. Whereas the series D later stage has more than quadrupled. And that is the effect that we are seeing from these t prices and fidelities of the world that basically shifted their philosophy of investing from public listed companies to, to go into later stage of the privates. So when we, and the press journalism, yeah, we hear that uh, there's a hundred million around here, there's a 200 million around there, then we still read it and perceive it as if it was private equity yeah, and venture. So that's why we get the impression, oh, everything goes wild, we have fantastic high valuation, and what, what, what is it all about with this high um, high mm, volumes invested. But if you look at it, it's just a shift of a window which has taken place 10 years ago in the public markets and since the IPO prices went high and the, the protagonists had to move their policy, they shifted to the Series D rounds and that's why we have the impression that the private markets have changed. Um, here again, <clears throat> there are a lot of money is going into it more and more of the, of the later stage, the Wellingtons and the T. Rowe prices of the world get into the D rounds. You see that um, the top uh, 20 unicorns worldwide 
in fall 2014, the median financing of these ones, money in, was 514 million. And if you compare it to now, it has uh, uh, jumped to 800 million. So this phenomenon is, is, a, is a shift from public market investing to private market investing. So you can see that here there's a chart that sees which kind of investors are in the different unicorns. And what you can see that the normal ones, everybody would uh, uh, suspect, like the Excels, the Andreessen Horowitz's, Klarna Perkins, Sequoia's, they are represented. But to a very large degree, you also have the Tiro, Goldman, TPG, and Fidelity, those that like eight years ago or six years ago didn't show up in these kind of cap tables at all. Um, <clears throat> that was the overall view. What does it more mean on Europe? Europe, too, is still more capital efficient for investing than the US. In order to create uh, a 500 million exit for those that did the 500 million exit, in the US you needed an average to invest $62 million, in Europe $27 million. Um, looking <clears throat> a little bit a similar chart in for, for Europe, um, there has been happening a lot. Um, we see a lot of companies and VCs that show a similar concentration effect on financing and helping create unicorns as we have it in the US. Um, <clears throat> we have been fortunate to be in some of the nicer ones. Um, also, if you roughly calculate the underlying market cap or exit values of these um, of these companies, I'd say Index, uh, Lake Star, and Excel are both in the 30 to 40 billion cumulative marketing or, or exit uh, of, the, of the underlying businesses. So <clears throat> I would like to quickly um, bring your attention to two possible companies where we think that uh, become uh, unicorns. Again, you saw Algumi, um, so it would be a little bit repetitive. That's why I skip it. And the other, another company that we have is Terralytics. Terralytics tracks the movement of people when you move from one cell tower to another with your mobile device and uh, creating black like, movement pat pattern for, for uh, people when they, when they move around. So we invested in this company two years ago. They were tracking uh, 3 million people. Now they follow 450 million, uh, 450 million people uh, for 20 million people, creating 450 billion data points. So you know exactly how an entire city or an entire country is moving. So if technology works, then as we should see a video. Um, okay, that was a good assumption that I made this. Okay, can I get the video? Okay, before I bother them, um, I think, um, that's it. Um, you see there are companies in everybody's portfolio now that create more scale, that become bigger. And um, <clears throat> with a projection that um, we have for our portfolios, I'm sure that the other VCs have uh, professionalized very, very much and have a lot of own potential unicorns in their portfolio so that overall we can be very optimistic for the European ecosystem and um, that's why I'm very happy and I don't need to state like in 2009 that the ecosystem is fucked up. I think we have recovered greatly and uh, therefore with, with all the hopes for the future, I'm, um, I'm, I leave it. Thank you very much.